This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, Jamie Bogner. I'm in Seattle today for the podcast and uh, uh, a conversation that I was really curious to have with uh, Brian Teal and Greg Reichel of uh, Ghost Fish Brewing. We're going to talk about gluten-free beer today. Uh, welcome to the podcast, guys. Hey, Jamie. Uh, welcome to Ghost Fish. Welcome to Seattle. Yeah. Uh, I you know, was recounting before we started the podcast, the, my first experience with Ghost Fish was talking to you after a CBC event in Portland, Oregon. And I remember you like pulled some bottles of the original Watch Stander Stout in Bombers, 22-ounce Bombers, out of your trunk. I'm like, I want to give you this beer. And, and so, uh, um, but that was my first entree to Ghost Fish over the years. You guys have sent us beer. We've reviewed beer. Um, that Grapefruit IPA that you also won a GABF medal for scored a 93 amongst other IPAs, not gluten-free in our, uh, you know, IPA issue a couple of years ago. Um, that was a real eye-opening experience and, it, I, you know, and so your approach to brewing beer that's gluten-free, um, and making that beer not have to stand on its gluten-free category, you know, or be judged only against gluten-free beer, but, but playing with beer in general and making for a compelling drinking experience has always been an exciting one. And I can't wait to talk to you about how you all make this beer, design beers, use non-gluten grains, you know, to brew beer um, and how that varies, uh, you know, from normal or I shouldn't say normal, uh, the more mainstream barley based kind of brewing process. We're going to do that. But first, as the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling, g and chillers has set the standard on quality, service, reliability and dedication to their customers craft. New this year, redundancy meets efficiency. g and micro channel condensers are built with all aluminum construction, which eliminates galvanic corrosion. Using half the refrigerant of conventional condensers with fewer brazed connections translates to a lower GWP and less opportunity for leaks. Call GD Chillers today to discuss your project or reach out directly at gdchillers.com. Also, this episode is brought to you by BSG Hop Solutions. Meet the latest in the BSG Hop Solutions portfolio, Sativa. Strong expressions of stone fruit, floral, and resinous pine flavors and aromas define this blend crafted specifically for use in hazy IPAs and other hop-forward beers. Sativa is ideal for aroma, whirlpool, and dry hop additions to hazy and juicy IPAs or for any other hoppy styles where a combination of citrus, tropical fruit, and pine aromatics are desired. Go to bsgcraftbring.com to learn more or call 1-800-374-2739. So, Brian... Let's talk about Ghost Fish. Give me the background and, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, that entree into craft beer, uh, a little bit on your background and uh, and how Ghost Fish came to be focusing on brewing gluten-free beer. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I If it's okay, I'm going to pick up from that uh, that segue into that uh, CBC in Portland. I, I can't remember the, the, the year that that was, but uh, you mentioned about pulling beers out of the trunk. And, you know, in the early early days, uh, you know, I was pulling a lot of beers out of the trunk. Sure. We literally were just uh, a few months into the operation that Watch Standard Stout was our first beer that we produced in uh, March of 2015. The project itself really started several years prior to that. Uh, we had an idea, myself and another individual, uh, that uh, we wanted to open up a brewery uh, to what I what I call crappy home brewers. Uh, I'm... I'm I'm fine admitting that, um, but sure, we were having sure. we were having a good time, and so uh, we had this idea. And there's there's a funny thing that happens when you tell enough people about something, and they start to you know accountability sets in. You're like, oh shit, I really got to start doing something. Right. And so nobody ever said no to the idea of not you know opening up a brewery, and it just sort of sort of grew legs. A lot of people don't understand uh, or have never heard the story that when we uh, first started with this idea. Uh, we did not have intentions to be a dedicated gluten-free brewery. We were mm. going to be just another brewery uh, brewing, you know, traditionally, you know, with barley, wheat, rye. Um, and uh, my background, my professional background uh, comes from the aluminum can industry. So about uh, 21 years with Ball Corporation, almost four, four and a half years with Crown Packaging. Uh, I worked with a lot of the macro beverage companies, both beer and, and carbonated soft drinks. And uh, the last 
really four years of my career in that industry was uh, as craft brand manager. So I was I was working directly with right. pretty much any craft based customer that wanted to put their product uh, in cans, whether it be beer, cider, mead, uh, coffee. And so that really gave me an insight of that I really wanted to make the shift uh, and really get in this industry. Um, and it was really sort of that insight into seeing what the trends were back in 2013, 2014, as far as where the growth would be. And there was some fear and trepidation that uh, we, we knew we were going to have to hire a brewer. Uh, it wasn't going to be uh, myself or <laughs> right, the other right. individual. And so you're the crappy home brewer. You're not going to. Exactly. Yeah. And so maybe we get lucky and, you know, but, but probably not. And let's face it. I mean, we're here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, this is I don't want to be disrespectful to any other brewery anywhere else. But uh, this there's a reputation of sure, of sure. beer quality out here in the Pacific Northwest. So we really had no desire to be the worst new brewery on the block. Right. And so it was that combined with the fact that. Uh, a lot of loved ones in my life uh, uh, are celiacs, and uh, I had tasted a lot of the, the gluten-free beer offerings. Sure. And I was underwhelmed by what was being put out. And so uh, we floated, I floated an idea to my business partners that uh, was a, a little tough to digest for, for everybody. And uh, we, we talked more about it, and we, we said, if we can do it. Tough to digest. Is that your pun? <laughs> pun, pun not intended, but should be probably. But uh we, we really set off with uh, the foundation of what today Ghost Fish looks like, and that is uh, pushing the boundaries of beer, not, uh, you know, not wanting to be the, the, just the best gluten-free beer out there, but really striving to be something uh, uh, amazing that everybody could really enjoy. Uh, all the while doing it in a way that's safe for celiacs, uh, right. no cross-contamination, being a 100% dedicated facility, but really seeing what's possible. And you know, like it's not just, you know, like you can't, it sounds very exciting to say, you know, we did this and like here we are six years later, but there were a lot of things going on on this side of the fence, meaning that, you know, the, the malts were becoming available to us. Previous, you know, versions of gluten-free beers had to rely on other raw materials that we don't necessarily like so much. Yeah. And so we'll name names later on. Yeah, but, uh, exactly. Exactly. Not of breweries, but certainly of uh, the S word. Right. Exactly. So. <laughs> So we had we had some things, some right, some, right. some some tailwinds behind us to get to where we're at. For sure, for sure. Um, you know, I know of course this subject is interesting to me now. Also, it, it's more personal, I should say, just because uh, uh, my my youngest son was recently diagnosed with celiac, and uh, you know, and so we are working through that kind of gluten free lifestyle on his behalf now. Um, you know, it, it's an important thing for people who want to be able to enjoy life and all enjoy the beer. But I also love the idea that. Uh, um, it doesn't, you know, that people who don't have that concern can still enjoy a beer and come here, you know, or buy it and, uh, um, you know, for any reason, just enjoy well-made beer. Uh, the potential for this brewery also seems to align with um, that ingredient piece. I think that, you know, there's that's another interesting one to look at from a dynamic standpoint. Like, you know, current modern hazy juicy IPA wouldn't be possible if the agriculture side on hops breeding and development didn't also, you know, produce the kinds of things that, that help make those beers. You know, for your beer and this brewery as a whole, um, you know, one of the things that makes it viable is that better brewing ingredients also started to become available for brewers that wanted to brew gluten-free beer. Um, they weren't commercially available at this kind of quality for brewers in the past. Um, talk to me a little bit about how those two pieces aligned for you. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a great uh, uh, topic right there. And, and, and it's, so, it's so true. Uh, like, you know, like, like I said before, we wouldn't be here without you know, basically these wonderful uh, raw materials, you know, these, these grains and the malts that we work with. Um, and it's been, it's been a journey and we're still on this journey. You know, one of the things that, that gets overlooked, you know, when you talk about a gluten-free beer is that there's a lot of focus on it being gluten-free, but you start to peel away the, the layers and you realize that, you know, when you, when you look at it, you're talking about, you know, processes that have been going on for a long time. Right. In fact, these grains, you know, are not new to brewing beer. I mean, they, a lot of them predate, you know, uh, modern, you know, use of barley and sure, sure. things like that. So, but never really in this context. And so, um, 
what's old is new again. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, we've always said we really, we, we love brewing with these beers. We think they make great flavor, you know, that, uh, the millet itself has, you know, like a really a nice bready biscuity flavor that you don't get from other grains. Um, we've never been in a position where we're like saying we're anti, you know, like gluten beers or anything like sure, that. Sure. This is just a different version of some of the same styles, you know, that people enjoy. Um, and oftentimes you really can't even tell the difference. Um, but to back to your, to your point, the emergence of, um, you know, these dedicated gluten-free malt houses, um, putting out some just high quality malt, uh, really propelled us to be able to, to do what we're doing and to, to really experiment. And really we're on the, we're just on the, on the cusp of what's possible with these things. Right. Uh, some really cool stuff that, uh, you know, we've been working on that uh, I think are relevant. Uh, you know, we've had a great relationship with uh, Washington State University and their specialty grains program. They just got a huge grant from the Western Wares uh, uh, organization that uh, they're going to be focused on the use of uh, buckwheat and millet uh, in fermentation. Uh, you think about the malts that are used uh, traditionally today. They've had hundreds of years of, of, if not longer, of tinkering, as right, I say. Right. What people don't really understand is that, uh, for example, millet is, you know, is, is a big part of our beer production. The number one use of millet in the United States is birdseed. Hmm. So uh, these grains haven't had the tinkering you know, right. that's there necessary hasn't been a commercial drive to, no. you know, find to optimize for flavor based or perform malt performance or anything like that. Exactly. Just, you know, it just needs to be good per feed. Right, right. right. Exactly. So, uh, and, and that combined optimize with for fact, yield so that they can make money right. selling it to bird feed yeah. more than it is about, yeah. Bird seed, you know, mo uh, you know, the other sources are, are, are the birds doing sensory on this to, you know, to talk about well, that I, flavor impact. I sure hope so. Yeah. You know, there's probably a joke there somewhere, but I'm not that witty, <laughs> but, uh, but so, yeah, so there's, there's challenges there, but, uh, there's, there's an awakening, you know, and it's, it's, uh, there's obviously, you know, more and more people doing what we've been doing and there are people doing it before we were, we're doing it. So, I mean, it's, a, there's a nice, uh, uh, upswing of, 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 uh, interest, you know, in terms of the gluten-free dedicated gluten-free beer segments. And, uh, that's largely driven by what's going on on, on the, uh, the grain and malt side as well, too. For sure. For sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you build a beer. You know, I mean, we know from a, a more, you know, a mainline barley brewing kind of process to how recipes are built. Um, and I'm curious to talk about, you know, to think about that because, you know, there wasn't really a playbook like, you know, for you guys to, to uh, other than looking at how no beer recipes that are barley based are brewed, you know, there, there wasn't this like, well, we should build it with this kind of thing. Um, and so I'd love to, kind of walk through that before we do that the most common complaint about hard seltzers they need more flavor extract alone is a weak flavoring agent and can leave a chemical aftertaste but there's a better way the craft concentrate blends from old orchard are packed with real fruit first no added sugars and just enough natural flavor breweries are turning to old orchard concentrates for seltzer with more body color and aroma Turn seltzer skeptics into supporters with seltzer that drinks like a beer. Get started at www.oldorchard.com slash brewer. Also for years, Brewery DB has been the industry's only professionally curated source of brewery and beer information. In 2019, over 1 million brewery visits were made by craft fans searching for breweries on brewerydb.com. In just a few weeks, Brewery DB will unveil an all-new experience to help craft lovers get back on the brewery trail. To take full advantage of the enhanced marketing power of Brewery DB and increase your taproom traffic, set up your account on marketmybrewery.com. That's marketmybrewery.com. It's easy and it's free. Greg, why don't you um, you know talk to me about how um, you know Ghostfish starts like building a recipe? What's that base for a recipe, and how how do you build up from there? Uh, and obviously, different beers are going to be done in different ways, but uh, you know, in, in a most kind of common thing, what you know, how do you build a base and then then create a beer from there? So for sure, I actually created my first recipe uh, this last week and got it on tap. And what it really started with is addressing the style that you want, but then kind of reverse engineering how you're going to make that possible. I come from a conventional brewing, distilling, and malting background. So for me, when I came in here, everything was turned around. You know, you're taking yeah, a, sure, you're, sure. you're taking barley, which is 
you know, 100% made for brewing, has unbelievably high starch content. The husk breaks apart to make everything nice and easy. And suddenly you're dealing with things like buckwheat and millet, which I had never even seen before. And you're suddenly taking these styles and you're saying, okay, how do we transform something into a gluten-free beer? And thankfully, we have uh, a lot of great malt houses, including Skagit and Grouse, that are out there creating great tasting millet sure. that can actually take you quite a bit of the way to begin with. So we have things like Vienna millet, Munich. We have obviously Pale. Um, so we can start with that to begin with. At which point things start to get fuzzy. Sometimes you so don't mill have... Millet is this base malt that you, you lean on heavily. Yeah. Cool. But there's always something out there that isn't available. You know, like say you want a specific kind of Pilsner malt or you want uh, something else. And you're like, okay, well, I have to like kind of reverse engineer this. I have to mix like, you know, either pale with a little bit of Munich or something like that. Uh, right, and try right. to put it together as best you can. Uh and so it's a lot of 40 chess, I guess, in <laughs> in uh, gluten-free brewing because you're not just putting together malts to make equivalents. You're also oftentimes creating, you know, cocktails for the enzymes necessary to even make fermentation possible. Sure. So, sure. you know, whereas from my experience at Elysian and Copperworks, uh, brewing was almost automatic. Sure. You're just like, yeah, barley. 150 degrees, it'll happen. Now it's more like, okay, we're going to put together these grains that aren't even remotely designed for brewing to begin with. They're, like Brian said, mostly sure. used for bird seed. And then from there, we're going to like strategize all the enzymes that we're going to put together. We're going to, uh, you know, create a regimen of how we're going to even mill these things. Right. Because when you're talking about brewing with, rice millet buckwheat and other things all at the same beer you're talking about incredibly different grains here you're not sure just talking about the two you know wheat and barley that are most often used right in the beer. right so so how how does millet perform relative to something like barley you know in terms of you know I, i'm thinking like I mean, even mashing temperatures and, and this kind of enzymatic conversion, like how we like it does it operate at similar temperatures as barley? How do you mash something like that? So I don't uh, know as much about. Sure. Like the, sure, sure, sure. The Gre Greg's uh, for the audience. Greg's uh, working on month two, <laughs> yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. So he's been with us I'm a short period of time. Yeah, yeah, a little yeah. bit. <laughs> Um, how does it, what do you, how, when you're a, to a mash regimen, you know, for a, for a recipe, like, um, how does that uh, compare to a, a typical barley mash? So if you're talking about your mash regimen, oftentimes you're almost pretending like the millet isn't even there and you're actually mashing more to the specifics of the enzymes that you're using. Okay. So you're going to, you know, hit it at 145 or 152, whichever the enzymes you're using are performing best at. So those enzymes are enzymes, you know, it doesn't matter what the yeah. grain is. Okay. Fermentables are fermentables. Yeah. Just put it in there, uh, add rice holes to make it not stick and you're off on your own. But you're really just thinking about enzymes when you're, you know, in the mash process. You're right. not really worried about uh, much else in that scenario. Sure, sure. Um, with millet, um, you know, in terms of fermentability, how, how does it compare to, you know, to barley? Um, so significantly lower starch content yeah. uh, right off the bat. Yeah. Um, I mean, even just in size. I mean, when you lay a, if you lay a kernel of barley, you know, in front of us, you know, next to a seed of, of millet. Sure. You know, I mean, I know it's, uh, it's considered a grain, but uh, it looks more like a seed. You know, just just the size alone, you can see that there's right. there's less there. But uh, um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it is very amazing. You know, when you step back and look to see that we're actually making beer from, you know, from 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 millet. Um, but um, uh, well, the history of beer making through the centuries or millennia, for that matter, has always just used whatever was available to people. Sure. And so, uh, um, you know, we've industrialized and organized it over the last 150 years in a very, you know, structured way. But I mean, um, you know, it's, it's been weird for most of beer's history. Um, you know, so with this millet, um, kind of, I mean, 
there's not brewing software that mm-hmm. is going to give you all of this information on in terms of extract potential and you know how this is going to work. You know, definitely what, not. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So it'd be it, nice if there was, right, Greg? Yeah. There, I mean, th- many times these grains aren't even programmed into recipe calculators. Right. Like you do, the grain doesn't exist on a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so oftentimes you have to like pre-strategize these grain bills to achieve different things for each individual grain. So you're using uh, millet as a bulk of starch. You're using buckwheat to provide both dextrins and even like uh, head retention on there. Mm. You're putting in uh, rice for biscuity flavors and also more starch content. Right. You're just really piling in and you're really thinking about every single ingredient to a degree that I, you know, I never had to think about when it came to barley. You were like, Pilsner flavor, Pilsner malt, do it. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Um, how how would a typical mash bill look for something like a lager that you were trying to brew? So, um, you know, since it's not, you know, if you if I'm thinking like, right, it'd be all Pilsner malt if it was a barley beer. But, you know, since you're having to kind of blend that kind of starch and enzymatic activity to actually create a fermentable beer, how do you how would a, you know, a typical mash bill start to look from that? So you would take your you would take your base malt just like you would with a regular uh, all barley beer, you would then start to consider basically your head retention to begin with. So usually that's going to be a combination of either biscuit rice or buckwheat, which have um, the necessary compounds to make that happen. Yeah, And then you're tabulating what kind of enzymes you might get from the ingredients you have to begin with and then adding enzymes to make up the difference. So, so things like Ondea or ceramics, you're adding that directly into your mash in a giant, you know, cocktail basically <laughs> right, right. to make this all possible. Uh, thankfully with lagers, a lot of the core ingredients are available to us. Things like rice and corn, we can get away with that. Right. Um, and it actually, from my experience, makes for uh, some of our better beers because we don't have to lean on substitutions nearly as much. We can use the real ingredients that everybody else does and focus on a much smaller portion of the grain bill. Um but simultaneously, there are a lot of factors about gluten-free ingredients that you don't have to worry about in barley brewing. Things like DMS is not nearly as much of an issue. Yeah. Uh, things like diacetyl, not nearly as much of an issue. Uh, yeast health is oftentimes when you're adding in all these enzymes and you're adding in uh, these this wide variety of grains, you actually oftentimes have a great yeast health uh, huh. pretty automatically. That's really interesting. Um in terms of like rough percentages, you know, how much do some of these smaller pieces play in a in an overall malt bill? You know, and I know that obviously that's going to change from beer to beer, but uh, you know, how much does millet make up? Is that a eighty percent of the beer? Is it ninety percent of the beer? Is it's you know? Yeah, so it, it obviously varies from recipe to recipe. Millet is typically uh, for some of our core brands more like around sixty percent of the grain bill. Yeah, and then you have rice, which will be somewhere between you know forty or twenty percent, depending on what we're going for. And then buckwheat, which is uh, as well as biscuit rice, which is a core part of head retention. Biscuit rice, yeah, okay. is uh, going to oftentimes be between uh, five and fifteen percent of the grain bill. So, um, as well as adding like buckwheat for dextrin qualities, because when you're adding in all these enzymes, like they will take it to zero if, yeah. if you allow it to. Huh. So you have to kind of, you know, pre-plan your final gravity before you make the beer. Sure, sure. Um, talk, talk to me a little bit about flavor contribution of, uh, you know, of each of these. We did talk, you did kind of mention it quickly, but I'm curious, you know, as you, you know, you're building the functional side of it, but you're also trying to build familiar beer flavors into those. Um, you know, how do, and, and then within it, like, you know, there are now malt houses treating things like millet in different ways to provide some of those different flavor and color kind of uh, uh, options for you as brewer. Talk to me a little bit about some of that variety and how those uh, flavors and colors uh, come from some of these. Thankfully, when we're talking about things like uh, caramel malts or we're talking about roasted malts, biscuit malts, we can get away with um, pretty much the exact same flavor profile, just used on a different ingredient because yeah. those are driven by the roast and the toast. 
Whereas that's interesting that it's more about the way that 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 grain is treated or the way that that ingredient is treated more than it is the ingredient itself. Yeah. But when we're talking about like, say, a sort of starchy, the real bready barley flavors yeah. going on here, that is much more difficult to replicate okay. when it comes to gluten free brewing, because these are things where they're not inherent upon buckwheat, millet right. or uh, or rice. They are things that you need to work together and try to create. And I, that's a good, good uh, point that I want to kind of seg- segue into. And that is, you know, we've, what Greg said about, you know, like barley's flavors and, you know, if we were to try to emulate those things, it's never really been in our game to sort of try to create, you know, something. I mean, we've really stayed in the lanes. And so your question about flavor and color, um, you know, of course, palates are different, but for me, um, I get some really nice bready, biscuity flavors off of the millet when we're, when we're, um, you know, graining out, you know, and stuff. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, reaching your hand in and getting a, a nice scoop of malt, malt meal, um, really pleasing. The, the, the buckwheat has a, a, a definitive earthy, some earthy yeah. tones to it, um, and so uh, that that adds some 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 interesting you know notes to when you're you know you're looking to do di- different things, um, and then of course the, the the rice you know I mean it's it's used in a lot of beer it's been used for a long time and sure. it has its flavor profile probably the closest of what we use to actually barley both in size and and flavor you know it's more like kind of grape nutty things like that um, so you know. We have said here at Ghostfish that uh, if it weren't for the price of these grains, uh, we'd continue to do. You know, if someday you know there was a, a physician out there that uh, that that discovered the cure for for celiac disease, and uh, your son could 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 <laughs> yeah. could could eat right, right. eat and drink whatever you know that that he wanted to, we probably would do the same thing because we f- we feel like this makes really good beer if it weren't for the fact of, of some of the challenges and also the, the, the costs involved in this. Right. Talk to me about those costs. Um, you are you using grain that is really, you know, on, on a lot of levels, a craft product um, and comes with craft malt prices, you know, to it. Um, you know, that, that's, that poses some interesting challenges to the business, but, uh, you know, what, what do some of these grains tend to cost for you? Yeah. Just to, to, on average, uh, uh, they're anywhere from five to 10 times more expensive than traditional wow. malts. Uh, so there's definitely some obstacles, you know, from, from the beginning now, six years into this, obviously. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a classic example of supply and demand, um, and, you know, we've seen some good synergy there. Um, and obviously our volumes, you know, help to, to, uh, you know, drive some of those, you know, costs down a bit, but, uh, still we're, we're definitely handicapped out of the gate, you know, compared to what, you know, traditional brewers are paying for traditional malts as well too. But at the same time, you're also, you know, that those prices support some of these smaller craft, uh, maltsters that are making some of these. You know, and they certainly need <laughs> no, no need doubt. To, and that's know. a great point, Jamie, that, you know, I certainly don't want to overlook that, uh, yeah. you know, they they have a tr- tremendous amount of investment into what they're doing. And there's also, you know, safety it's a niche, involved. It's too. a niche thing. Yeah. There's only so many brewers that are going to want or need this, but they need, you know, so so it is supporting that entire you know spectrum. Absolutely. Of, uh, of this. And uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and just like all craft malt, even craft barley malt, you know, those smaller maltsters, you know, um, and that kind of connection to the agriculture becomes a, an important piece of this whole equation. And, uh, you know, and it's great to see that kind of deeper connection. Um, you work pretty closely, you know, in some cases with some of these small maltsters, you know, talk, talk to me a little bit about that kind of give and take. Cause I mean, at the same time, you know, they're giving you what they think are the, or some of the parameters for how some of these things work or asking, you know, what new products you might need at the same time. I imagine there's some information flow back to them for how some of these things are working in the brew house so that they can, you know, continue to, you know, dial those, uh, you know, those, uh, gluten-free malts in for you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as I said before, I'll say it again, you know, we wouldn't be here having this probably this conversation if it weren't for, you know, the, the malt houses that we do work with. And we've had a very close relationship, continue to, to stay very close to, you know, our, our suppliers. Uh, and it, it is, it is, it is definitely a free flow of information, 
they're they're interested in innovation as we are as well too. So you know they'll come out with a new roast, um, and you know we'll sample it and give feedback on that. Do some malt sensory, uh, and uh, it's just been really trial and error on 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 all you know aspects of you know sort of this segment. And you know of course new players, new individuals into it. I mean the the, the really cool thing for me. Uh, you know, starting this, you know, when I did and where things have come and gone is that uh, there's a, a growing interest even on the home brewer side of right. gluten-free brewing, a very strong, the zero tolerance group, you know, is out there. And uh, in some aspects, they're they're leading the charge on not just, you know, brewing, but even, you know, experimenting with, you know, these grains and, you know, and malting them and different things like that, that is interesting that it sometimes those that information is getting back to the malt houses as well, too. Yeah. So there's like all ears are always open, you know, as far as what's possible. And, uh, you know, we we're really looking for here at Ghost Fish and some of these relationships, you know, that we've had uh, not only with our malt houses, but it goes even a little bit deeper with even the farmers. Uh, you know, millet traditionally is grown in Colorado, but it's it can be grown in many different areas. There's there's millet being grown here in the state of Washington and Eastern Washington. And we really look forward to the day, uh, Jamie, when we can have a conversation standing in the middle of a, a millet uh, field uh, here in Washington and, and be speaking to the, the farmers and telling them what we'd really like to see in the end product and them being able to work with, uh, you know, their, their uh, you know, the, the seed producers, the, the universities that are doing these tests and, and, and experiments and, and working on these malts that to be able to get us what we can so we can have a, you know, an, an all Washington grown, you know, beer, like a lot of our friends and, and uh, you know, people in the industry out here, you know, do on a daily basis. It's like not a big deal, right? <laughs> right, right. You've got <laughs> barley fields, you've got, you know, some yeah. of the best hops in the world. Um, you know, there's, you know, any kind of fruit you want grown right here in Washington state. And so uh, um, you're right. You could, uh, you can do that, except now I guess you, you got to work on your millet. Um, but it is interesting that you're working with a agricultural extension to you know, help, um, you know, develop some of those and work on, uh, on trials for potentially new ingredients that could ultimately, I mean, that's, you got to be looking years in advance on a, you know, down the road for a project like that to say, Hey, we want to get involved and do this now, um, for something that might not come to fruition for seven, eight or 10 years. Yeah, totally. Totally. I mean, it was, it was partly due to self-preservation to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, because when we stepped back and looked at, uh, uh, how many, so few players that, uh, are, are, are making malt for us, you know, one one quick mishap, you know, and basically, you know, um, our supply chain, you know, dries up. Right. And so it really was uh, looking outward into the future and, uh, you know, trying to maintain, you know, our interest and in, in what we're trying to do and realizing that, as I said before, there's there hasn't been this tinkering. Uh, you know, it's kind of the best way I can describe it, you know, that's gone on uh, on this, you know, this side of the uh, the, the brewing equation. And um and so to really get in with those extensions and uh, to to start to form those relationships and have those conversations and have an interest in, in in what we're doing as well, too, has been exciting. So we're starting to see that take fruition. Um, and I'm excited about what WSU is doing. But there's other extensions. Uh, you know, I know the University of Nebraska, you know, has, has made a lot of contributions to our to grouse, uh, you know, one of our primary malt house in Colorado. And so there's others that have, you know, gotten involved in this. And so it's, it's a community that, uh, we're really sure. starting to see take, take form. And, um, it's, it's really interesting for me to kind of see what the future lies, you know, with not only gluten-free brewing, but uh, on the malt side of things too. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, the individual expressions and some of the beers that you find, um, really capture, you know, the, the, the flavor that you're trying to deliver, but, um, you know, use some of these ingredients in, in interesting or creative ways. Before we do that, the founders launched SS Brewtech with a very clear goal to advance brewing equipment design, performance, and quality to the very highest standards in the industry. With a team that draws upon strong functional backgrounds in brewing science, mechanical engineering, industrial design, supply chain, and manufacturing, 
SS Brewtech has the people and skill sets you want and expect from your supplier of pro brewing equipment. Head over to ssbrewtech.com for more information on their brew houses and brewing gear. Also, food grade lubricants are not your top concern. Your beer is. Lucky for you, Clarion has a passion for protecting your beer by helping to make your brewing system 100% food safe. When you switch to Clarion food grade lubricants, you're reducing the risk of costly contamination and recalls to virtually zero all while extending the life of your equipment. And that leaves you with peace of mind to think about what really matters. Go to clarionlubricants.com to learn more. So let's talk about some of the the ways that these you know, brewing techniques are uh, reflected in some of your specific beers. Um, you, we talked a little bit about the watch standard stout first. Um, you know, you know, talk to me a little bit about uh, the kind of peculiarities potentially of, uh, of brewing stout with some of these uh, uh, non-gluten grains um so i actually brewed a watch standard uh just two days ago and it was the first time i had actually brewed this recipe before and obviously i brewed uh many stouts before at uh lesion and you know i went into it it's a very intimidating style because it's oftentimes it's a it's usually a big beer it uh you know is almost you know, destined to cause chaos in a brew house. It is a lot going on right, sometimes. Right. And jumped into this one and um, it was not more difficult than brewing with barley. Yeah. But a lot of what was going into it was, you know, it was one of the most natural feeling uh, beers that I've done here so far. It actually was like, it, it felt right. It looked right. It was a lot of just basically replacing barley with uh pale barley with right. uh rice and millet using buckwheat and then adding in a lot of interesting ingredients into it so we have like james brown rice which i didn't even know was a thing james brown rice is a thing yeah really okay. like, papa's got a brand new bag hey. oh <laughs> uh and we had we also uh get to use candy syrups on these ones which is yeah. something that i didn't get to use at other breweries um yeah it was it was a great experience um it's honestly one of the styles because you're not leaning on the inherent flavor of barley uh it's one that's more automatic yeah yeah a stout is you know typically difficult in gluten-free brewing you know from the standpoint you know for the flavors you can achieve you can hit those but it's you know if you're looking for that sort of thick you know like right, uh right. you know uh stout you know that's where you know, any gluten-free beer, you know, uh, there's, there's definitely a, a, a thinner body to gluten-free beers in general. So it comes out probably more prominent in, in a stout. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, uh, the stout was our first beer that we put out. It's also was a, a 2015 gold medal winner at JBF, but, uh, it, there's been quite a bit of tinkering with that beer as well too, to, to get it to where it's at today to, to, to address, you know, some of those deficiencies that, you know, that, that the feedback that we got from consumers that they wanted, you know, the mouthfeel to be a certain way, you know, right. they wanted the body to be a certain way, but yet still, you know, hit all those roasty, toasty, you know, chocolatey coffee, you know, like notes that, uh, that you come to expect in a stout. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I meant to come talk about this earlier, but, uh, on the fermentation side, you know, a after that kind of hot side process, um, do these beers generally, you know, are they, do they differ at all from uh, typical barley brewing? Uh, yeah. So we oftentimes experience a lot less of some of the typical off flavors and esterification that you would experience in uh, typical barley brewing. So the first thing that you noticed and blew my mind was that we have a virtually zero diacetyl problem, which I like every uh -oh, brewer. Now everybody's oh, going to want to do if, it. If there's <laughs> yeah, one good thing to come out of this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's one good thing is, yeah, you know, tell your friends is that right. diacetyl is not really an issue in gluten free brewing. Um, whereas, yeah, every other brewery and distillery I've worked at just standing around, basically it's a diacetyl free plant, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, 
in terms of yeast activity and performance, other than it doesn't produce the similar kind of you know, esters, um, are there any other impacts of uh, that happen through fermentation? Are there specific yeasts that you lean on in order to do this that work better with these grains or are you using typical brewery yeasts? So we, yeah, so we don't have a house strain like many breweries do. We actually use uh, uh, brick yeast for almost everything we do. And we have a quite a wide variety of those that we do use. So from there, uh, we get to pinpoint the yeast flavors that we're trying to produce and yeah. not really get very, very much um, unexpected flavors out of them. We're able to pitch as much as we want into a beer as, hmm. as automatically as we like. Um, we really don't have yeast health issues and it's, um, it's pretty exciting place to be. <laughs> we do, though, we do have yeah. to be careful because, uh, you know, most, uh, cultures are grown on a, uh, medium that, that, that does contain wheat. So okay. it's not, we, we're not, as Greg said, you know, we're, we're fortunate, uh, it's come a long way. It continues to, to get better with time, uh, different companies, you know, that have, have stepped into this, uh, you know, this, this segment, uh, and providing more, you know, different yeast strains that, uh, that we can use, but we do, we have to vet those out as well too, because, uh, you know, not, uh, not every yeast basically is, uh, is suitable for what we're doing. Sure. Sure. And I guess that really is an interesting kind of concern all along the way that if any of these ingredients come in contact with gluten containing ingredients, then they're not gluten free. And so everywhere from the you know, malt houses that you work with have to potentially use, you know, or either highly clean or use dedicated equipment, um, you know, in order to, to kind of process and, and clean grain or, you know, and, uh, and I imagine you find yourself or then even like barrel aging, you know, you want to make sure that you're putting in, you know, there's, there's all sorts of, cons you know, concerns all along the, yeah. the chain for this. It's just, a, I think it's a layer, basically what you described, Jamie, is it's a layer that, that, that really isn't, uh, just, you know, it's not an issue in any other brewery, right? You know, uh, that, that I know of, unless you're, you know, a dedicated, you know, gluten-free brewery like we are. Uh, but yeah, it's constantly on our mind. You know, it's, uh, it's looking at the entire supply chain and really vetting it out, you know, ahead of that to make sure you don't get into that situation. Um, and we've been fortunate that, uh, we haven't had to deal with that, but, uh, we're also, you know, very involved, you know, with all of our suppliers and, and where they're sourcing from and their processes and things like that. So we've, you know, we spent a lot of time, you know, in, in uh, visitations and and discussions, and there's a lot of like uh, third party testing that goes on and things like that. So, but uh, that's you know, we, we decided to be this, and that's you know, we're committed to this, and uh, we've yeah. got a whole bunch of people uh, out there that uh, depend on us doing you know this due diligence on a daily basis. Sure, sure. Um, you know, and of course, you know, you lean on some suppliers outside of just the craft malt uh, you know uh, world who also are supplying f to other food, uh, uh, you know, makers. And so, you know, all that entire sector that is serving, whether it's gluten-free beer or gluten-free, you know, food all has that same kind of, you know, chain of custody and making sure, you know, so you can benefit from some of that that happens on that side too. Absolutely. You're, 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 you're spot on there. So Brian, we're, uh, we're getting on in time here, but, uh, talk to me about the big picture for, um, for ghost fish. Um, what success looks like, um, uh, you're all, you are currently the largest dedicated gluten-free brewery in the United States producer yeah. producer. Yep. Okay. So in terms of volume, you're, you're producing more beer, more gluten-free beer, um, as a dedicated gluten-free beer producer. Now, certainly there are larger giant mega brands that are making a gluten-free product and, uh, mass marketing it out there, but as a craft brewery making only making gluten-free beer, now I'm starting to parse this out really, really <laughs> tightly. Anyway, you make a whole bunch of this and you, yeah. uh, you know, you send it all over the country right now you have, you're in multiple States, um, East coast, West coast, everything else. Um, you know, what is, you know, what is that ultimate goal for ghost fish? What do you, um, you know, hope to achieve with this and how will you know that you've achieved that kind of success? Yeah, that's a big ball of wax there. But uh, for me, it's, uh, you know, it's the my vision for this company has has changed very little from from day one, uh, even despite, you know, typical curveballs and, you know, things that you didn't foresee. I always envisioned a situation where we could we we would get a high quality product into the hands of people that uh, unfortunately aren't aren't able to to have, you know, a good, a good beer experience anymore. And 
there's a lot of people today that still, you know, have heard about ghost fish, but haven't been able to, to get it because of where they live and the laws, you know, as they are in those places. And so, uh, we've really, uh, made, we made the decision, um, early on that, uh, if not us, then, uh, who, who would step into this, uh, this, this, uh, sure. sort of, you know, position. And, uh, we feel like why not us? Um, you know, our product's been, been proven in the market. Uh, you know, the awards are always nice and they sort of just tell us that we're on the right path. But, uh, uh, I feel like we haven't really, you know, even really stepped into our, our into our greatness of what's possible with ghost fish. And so for that, um, you know, we're going to continue to keep, uh, experimenting, refining our processes. You know, obviously, uh, for us, you know, it's either a volume game or get your cost down game. Um, so we're constantly working on all that, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, we've had two expansions over the last, uh, you know, really 15 months and, and that's, that's significant, obviously with what we're, you know, we've been involved with over, you know, the past uh, year, the pandemic and, and everything. Uh, and that's the, the consumers are driving that, uh, last year was, uh, on the, the wholesale side, the packaging side of our business, we couldn't make enough beer. And uh, so that forced us into, you know, a, a, another expansion that uh, really wasn't uh, planned that soon. But uh, <laughs> we said, yeah, we got to take advantage of this. And so there's some things that uh, I'm not really liberty to talk about right now. And, uh, and I'll make sure that you're one of the first ones. Well, that I know, appreciate Jamie. it. Yeah. But uh, uh, we're we're looking to 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 maintain, a, you know, a, at least a lead position in terms of being you know, at the forefront, you know, we'll certainly, you know, we're welcoming, you know, others that are doing some really great stuff in this, uh, in this field. And, uh, you know, we're learning from them. They're hopefully learning from us. And, um, you know, our goal has been the same from the beginning, make the highest quality beer possible that everybody can enjoy with the added benefit that those that need the safety of a gluten-free beer can rest assured that they're going to get that in ghost fish beer. That is a fantastic uh, way to approach all of this. Um, and, you know, on a personal level, I appreciate you all helping raise the profile of gluten-free beer by making compelling beers in that way. Um, you know, when we got into this and we're writing about gluten-free beer, it was back in 2015, I want to say, when we did that, that first gluten-free issue. Um, you know, it was just this finding breweries making beer that wasn't the sorghum-based gluten-free beer yeah, that I know we what all you're knew about. before <laughs> like uh um you know we all had that stigma around it because they were not good beers they were not beers that a beer drinker could enjoy drinking um and you and some of your contemporaries you know pushing the envelope with the help of of maltsters also helping you know support that um have entirely you know done a 180 degree turn on perception of gluten-free beer um and i think that it's a pretty awesome and cool th thing for having done that so cheers to you <laughs> <laughs> thank you jamie really appreciate that yeah yeah gnd chillers is the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling try sativa in your next hazy or juicy ipa craft juice concentrates from old orchard are packed with real fruit first set up your account on marketmybrewery.com today let SS Brewtech outfit your brew house and gain peace of mind with Clarion Lubricants. Of course, if you'd like to support this podcast, go to beerandbrewing.com, click on the subscribe button. If you're a pro brewer, consider all access pro subscriptions. Um, any subscriber to the magazine can pop into our archives and read that gluten-free issue where, uh, you know, we talked about those things. I mean, it's, it goes way back now, and, and certainly there is uh, more happening in that world now. We probably should revisit that and when we do. We're going to come talk to you about it right yeah. on. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Uh, uh, Brian Teal and Greg Reichel, Ghost Fish Brewing. Right on. Yeah, thanks, cheers. Jamie. Appreciate cheers. it very much. Yeah. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. For those that love to make and drink great beer, learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew.